Hi, everybody. I'm Mary Alexander. I'm a counsel in our tax group in the Washington, D.C. office. My practice focuses on sort of everything renewable, uh, wind, solar, carbon capture, RNG, et cetera. Um, so obviously in August, um, with the enactment of the Inflation Redu Reduction Act, um, there's a whole new slew of credits, um, kind of an alphabet soup now. Um, but one of the interesting things that was done um, was the tax code is now pulling in sort of other pieces of the law. Uh, one of the most interesting things um, that it has done is incorporate certain labor requirements, um, prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements. And we're lucky enough at v &E to have a really great labor and employment group. Um, so I'm joined here today by Alex, and I'll let Alex say a little bit uh, about his practice. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us either live or in on webcam. Um, my name is Alex Bluebond. I'm a counsel in our employment, labor, and OSHA group. My practice is, is pretty broad, but uh, with respect to the Inflation Reduction Act, the, how I got involved is I do a lot of things with government contractors. And so Davis-Bacon wages and prevailing wages are something that I'm very familiar with and kind of know how they, how they work and how you know, that might differ both from how they traditionally work with government contractors and how they might work for people who are doing IRA projects. Um, and I'll hand it back to Mary to kind of introduce everything. All right, so we'll get started here. So this slide is just really an overview of all the different things the Inflation Reduction Act did. Um, I'll walk through these pretty quickly, um, but if you have questions about anything on this slide, we have decks sort of on each individual topic, um, essentially, and are happy to, you know, schedule a call with you or whatnot to sort of get you up to speed on sort of whatever your particular area area or areas of interest are. Um, so like I said, there, this is just a historic investment um, in climate policy through the tax code. Um, the, one of the biggest things here is the just breadth of the extension, right? We've kind of been living with one and two year extensions of wind and solar, things were in phase down. Um, this extends uh, most credits kind of in their current form until 2025. And then there's a switch in 2025 to sort of a more technology neutral uh, credit type that focuses on having zero greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it also sort of gets rid of the phase down. So like the investment tax credit that was going down, you know, was at 26%, was scheduled to go down to 22%, is back up to a 30% investment tax credit. Um, big changes in uh, carbon capture, the credit there going up, the requirements for capture amount going down. Um, so and a lot of helpful stuff in that space to help make tax sort of less of a impediment. Um, there are provisions in here that encourage domestic manufacturing and mining both on the supply and the demand side. Um, there's EV provisions, a new commercial EV, a new e used EV uh, credit. There's extensions and expansions in the renewable fuel space. Um, one of the huge changes here uh, is the monetization of credits. You can now sell credits. Um, so that's big because it used to be you had to be an equity investor in a project to be able to benefit from the tax credits. So this should help open up the market. Um, also direct pay, that's one of the changes for like carbon capture and also the new hydrogen credit um, that we expect will be uh, very helpful because you can get direct pay for those credits, which basically means um, when you file your tax return, it's like you overpaid your taxes and you get a refund back. So it's like turning the credit into a grant essentially. Um, so it just gets you cash in your hands without having to have someone who can actually utilize the tax credit. Um, so that should help those spaces sort of, you know, prove out the technology and show that it works and show that they can generate credits um, sort of and help get those, those industries sort of on their, on their way. Um, like I said, really long runway for the credits, which should just help investment, right? People don't want to invest in things when, you know, you've got just a two-year clock. So, and then finally, the sort of last thing that's mentioned on this slide is the enactment of the corporate AMT. This brings in sort of new taxpayers, more tax capacity. Um, you can offset uh, the corporate AMT with credits. Um, so in the credit space, at least, this is just 
sort of, you know, more appetite for tax credits likely, because if you can go out and buy a tax credit for, let's say, 90 cents on the dollar, you're likely to do that instead of, you know, just pay the dollar to the government. Um, so that's kind of, that's the broad overview. So now we'll get into the actual interesting topic, which has been sort of in every single question, in every single sort of discussion we've had on the IRA, the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements are top of mind for everyone. And there's good reason for that. Um, they basically span this, the whole world of credits we've got now, right? Um, whether or not you're looking at a wind project, a solar project, carbon capture project, hydrogen, right? It's these provisions come into basically every credit now. Um, and what they do is they sort of break the credits into a, a base credit. And then they say, well, if you satisfy um, the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements, then we'll multiply that base credit by five is how the statute reads. So you can almost think about it though, as like you had your historic investment tax credit at 30%. And you can still get up to that 30%, but if you don't satisfy the prevailing wage and labor and apprenticeship requirements, the credit that's available is only 6%. So while this is drafted as sort of optional, economically, it might not be, right? Because to get the full credit value and to make your project really um, economic, you might, you might need the full 30% ITC, right? Which means you have to be satisfying these prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements. Um, so what are they? Um, well, the prevailing wage requirements are that laborers and mechanics um, on the project are paid Davis-Bacon prevailing wages. That applies during two sort of two periods, both the construction of the project and during the relevant credit period for alterations and repairs. So what is relevant credit period? Um, for like a solar project that's claimed ITCs, for example, you'd be thinking about like the recapture period, which is five years. If you're uh, a wind project that's claiming PTCs uh, over the 10 year period, that would be the, the relevant credit period, the 10 year period. Um, so what are the apprenticeship requirements? The apprenticeship requirements are that a taxpayer must ensure that qualified apprentices perform no less than the applicable percentage of total labor hours uh, of the project. So this is not based on sort of number of apprentices, it's based on sort of hours performed. And this ratchets up uh, to 15%. You can see that on the slide, it goes 10 to 12 and a half to 15. Um, there are a few exceptions um, from these rules sort of applying to you. One is if you have a small project below one megawatt, um, is generally exempt. The other sort of big exemption is that if you have begun construction, which is a term of art in the tax credit space, um, within 60 days after the date guidance is released, your project is exempt from these prevailing wage and labor requirements. Um, and so you would not, the, the project would not have to comply with those and would still be eligible for my example of you know, the 30% ITC, you would still be eligible for that 30% ITC because you would be kind of grandfathered in. Um, you, the, you know, next question everyone asks is, okay, well, how long do I have to begin construction? When is this guidance going to come out? Which is a, a great question. Um, and we have heard that they intend to get uh, guidance out by the end of the year. Um, which means, you know, let's say they release it December 1st. I think that that puts you, you know, somewhere at the end of January, right? As the 60 day clock runs out. Um, but what that also means is it's likely to be sort of sub regulatory guidance, um, like a notice or something like that. Um, they have, and we'll get to this at the end, they have requested sort of some preliminary comments, but I think Alex can sort of weigh in on this, but it would be nice to get sort of more formal guidance that we would have opportunity to comment on and sort of have the more formal regulation um, process. Um, yeah, there, there are a lot of kind of gray areas and substantive ones that we think should be fleshed out. And so doing that in a notice um, by the end of the year seems like it will be difficult to do and then maybe subject to some administrative challenges um, if they don't do the full notice and comment period. 
Um, so we'll, you know, we'll see how that shakes out, but I do think that there are some definite substantive areas that we're looking for some guidance on. Yeah, and I mean, one of the issues here too, right, it's just that you're trying to apply this. It's not just solar projects. It's solar projects, it's wind projects, it's carbon capture projects, it's hydrogen projects, right? It's across a spectrum of different technologies and types of facilities and, and you know, We'll, we'll, see, we'll see what they Yeah, and we'll, we'll get into some of the areas in which we're hoping yeah. to see the guidance as we go through this presentation. Okay, so the first uh, thing that I'm going to talk about are some of the, what are the prevailing wage requirements and what are prevailing wages? I think of the two broad categories of comments that, uh, or of uh, requirements that we're going to talk about today, people might be more familiar, or at least have a sense of what prevailing wages are. Um, these have been used for a long time in the government contractor sphere. Davis-Bacon prevailing wages in particular are the wages set by the Department of Labor for federally funded construction projects. Um, unlike a state minimum wage or the federal minimum wage, these aren't limited to just the straight hourly rate. Um, a prevailing uh, Davis-Bacon prevailing wage is going to include both a regular hourly rate and a fringe benefit amount. Uh, fringe benefits include your benefits plans like life insurance, health insurance, a pension, 401k contributions, but they also include things like vacation, holiday, sick leave. And what you're going to see if you were to look at a wage determination that contains the prevailing wage is an amount that you would contribute to fringe benefits. And then you could decide which fringe benefits you would want to contribute to. And you could also take the option of instead just paying that amount as cash, but typically you're going to get some sort of benefit, like a payroll tax benefit from including it in fringe benefits instead of paying that amount as cash. I think one of the other differences that we'll talk about between a Davis-Bacon prevailing wage and what you might see as a regular minimum wage is that they're not going to be for a whole area or kind of across the board, they're very specific. They're for particular job types on particular types of projects. And so it's a long list of jobs uh, that you'll have different minimum wages, so to speak, for. And so it's not as easy as just knowing, hey, we have to pay $15 an hour on this project. And so uh, you, you just do have, and it's going to be particular type of work that qualifies, like as we mentioned, it's construction and alteration and repair. Um, and so we, it's, you have to kind of determine what specifically you're going to pay Davis-Bacon wages for because it's not necessarily everything. Right, right. So the prevailing wage requirement, right, as we've said already, but it applies to construction of the project and alteration and repair of the project during the relevant credit period. So what does alteration and repair really mean? Like what's captured in that? Sure. So alteration and repair are typically going to be bigger uh, things that you'd have to do to your site as opposed to routine maintenance. So maintenance is specifically not covered by Davis-Bacon work, but the distinction between alteration repair and maintenance is kind of sometimes gr a gray area. It's sometimes fuzzy, um, but the Department of Labor has provided some guidance on how you can make that determination. And these typically come up in when you're doing a government uh, construction project there's both going to be the services that are provided related to the construction and the construction itself. So most of this guidance isn't really determined, isn't really in the context of what's covered and do we have to pay a prevailing wage for and what's not covered. It's which prevailing wage do you have to apply? But in, in the case of the Inflation Reduction Act, the only one that ever applies is the Davis-Bacon uh, prevailing wage. So if the Davis-Bacon doesn't apply, there's no separate prevailing wage that you have to worry about. So let's kind of look at some of the things that they're that they did you to distinguish between repair work and maintenance. Uh, repair work is, like I said, non-routine. It's often one-off fixes uh, or replacement of large fixed components. So that might be structural repairs to a building. It could be paving uh, paving repairs. Maintenance, on the other hand, is routine upkeep that keeps a site functioning at its continue at its. Uh, in continuous use, uh, scheduled and recurring uh, projects that you have that you know are going to happen kind of on a routine basis. Some examples of maintenance are kind of things like replacing light bulbs or HVAC filters 
mowing grass. These are services more so than construction. You can kind of see how a structural repair to a building is similar to the construction that the Davis-Bacon Act focuses on, whereas replace, replacing a light bulb doesn't really seem like it, it's construction. But there are some where it's not so clear. For example, an exam, uh, the deal gives roofing uh, shingling, repairing roof shingles as an example of repair work that's covered by Davis-Bacon. But replacing worn out carpet is not covered, that's maintenance. And you know, I, I don't do a lot of construction, so maybe someone who does these kinds of projects might uh, be able to tell the difference between roof shingling and, wearing, and replacing worn out carpet. But to me, those seem like kind of similar work. Um, and I'm not quite sure how to tell the difference between those two. Um, and there's kind of, and I think you'll see that as you go through this in your projects, there are other one, there are other things, replacing a transformer, replacing this component of a transformer, replacing this computer module. What is, is that repair work? Is that maintenance? It's not always going to be clear. And I think on a traditional, when on a traditional government contracts project, you'd work this out ahead of time you'd be able to work with your government contracting officer, the, the person who's uh, at the agency, and you come to some sort of agreement as to what's covered by which prevailing wage or what's not covered by a prevailing wage at all. But we don't really have that here on, in these projects. And so it's not clear. I think that's one of the things we're looking for in the guidance as to is there going to be, a, see if there's going to be a way for us to get this determination beforehand as to what is covered and what is not. Yeah, because I mean, like we said at the very, front end of this, right? It's 80% of the credit value that's on the line here, right? It's, it's a big loss if you're not satisfying this. And so it's, you know, you don't want foot faults and we'll get to the, the cure options later, right? But you don't want to have, you know, the point in time where you're saying, oh, yeah, yeah, we think this is maintenance, so we don't need to pay prevailing wages. And then it comes up on audit later, right? That, no, we really think that was repair work. You should have been paying it. You know, your credit is slashed, right? Like that's not, you don't want to be in that position. So I think also, you know, our advice, at least right now, until we get better guidance is to be very conservative on this issue, right? Kind of anything that's a gray area, just assume, assume you're in the, you know, prevailing wage category and you have to pay prevailing wages because in the long run, that's a lot less costly than losing 80% of your credit. And I saw a question come up here that was the question was, is demolition covered under construction for the Davis-Bacon Act? And traditionally, yes. But I think that, you know, based on the definition of when construction starts on these projects, yeah. it's it's a little bit more complicated because doing that demolition is not necessarily going to get that you the... That doesn't get you begun construction. Yeah. But is it part of sort of the construction of the project for purposes of these rules? It, yeah. Hard to say, yeah. honestly. Um, yeah. But yes, it would be covered by Davis Bacon traditionally. Yeah. So prevailing wages, I mean, one of the, I guess, the questions, where do you find them? And so they're published in something called wage determinations, which are these long, long PDFs that list just job category, job category, a job category or classification is essentially an occupation. Um, and so they will list them out for both a particular area. These are usually done on a county level and they will be listed for different types of projects. So a building project, a residential building project, a heavy project or a highway project. And there's a long manual as to you decide what type of project these are gonna be. But those all have separate prevailing wages for, depending on what the job is, where it is and what type of project it is. So for example, a crane operator on a residential construction project is gonna get paid a different amount than a crane operator on a building construction project. And then a crane operator on a residential construction project in Houston is gonna get paid differently than a crane operator on a residential construction project in New York or DC or Midland. Um, and so there's lots of different types of things you have to look at to determine what is the prevailing wage. And some of the job classifications you'll see are really generic. They're, they're broad. They're going to apply to a lot of different types of projects. The ones I've listed here are electrician, carpenter, roofer. You can imagine how those apply to many, many projects. Some are very specific. Modular furniture installer, acoustical ceiling installer, tunnel mold boring machine operator. These, these aren't going to be on every type of project. And uh, frankly, I have not seen wage determinations that contain a lot of very specific job categories for renewable energy types of jobs. And so I think one of the main questions is going to be, what do we, what do, we do to find out what those prevailing wages are? Yeah, but I think Alex, sort of one of the questions that we've gotten a lot, right, 
does is do these prevailing wage requirements mean that you have to pay some sort of national average? And I think the resounding answer to that is is no, no. right? Yeah, it yeah. is very localized and it is sort of job type and location specific. It is. And so you can't just, it, it, you, it's hard to just have one number that you're going to apply. These are going to be my wage costs right. um, because you have to look at where you're doing the project and what types of labor you're going to have on that project. Right. So sort of increases in costs for any particular project are going to vary, right? Like if you're yeah. already in a location where maybe sort of you kind of the market demands a prevailing wage sort of to begin with, right? You might not be that impacted in your overall project cost, but if you're in a different labor market, it, it might have a pretty large impact. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that these prevailing wages are typically going to be above uh, the minimum wage. I mean, almost always, but also you're going to see them often be tied to union rates. And so we'll talk about how we come up with a prevailing wage a little bit later. But I guess the question here is what do we do if we don't have a wage determination that matches the particular job duty we're looking for, particularly on these renewable energy projects? There is a process called conformance uh, where you ask the DOL for that wage determination. And you can do a lot of things to kind of present them with evidence in order to get that determination that you want, because you're going to propose what you think the determination should be. And you might provide them with what you think people in that industry in that area are typically paid. So you have kind of some data of your own that you can provide them. You might compare it to similar jobs. So maybe there's something in the wage determination that's pretty close, but not quite what you're looking for. So you try to set it based on that. You might also look at, maybe they don't have that solar panel installer job category for Houston, but they have provided a similar job category, a similar determination for someone in New York. So you might say, how does that compare? Typically these wages in New York are this much higher. And so we would like to reduce that amount to have a wage determination set for Houston. Um, and I think that one of the things is it's, again, not quite clear about how that will work for IRA projects, because the way you would traditionally do that is work with your contracting officer with the government. And together, you would submit, we agree that this is the appropriate amount to pay people, and you'd send that to the DOL for a job, new job classification and wage determination. But again, you don't have that government contracting officer to sign off on that. So are you going to be able to go straight to the DOL yourself? That's, that's something we're kind of waiting to see. And how, so the, another difference is these will update pretty regularly, as, as whereas a minimum wage obviously requires a statutory adjustment, or if coal is built in, you get small adjustments. But these are wage determinations are published every year. And that they're based on wage surveys that they send out to people in the industry. And often, frankly, a lot of union members are the ones filling these out because that's who, because those unions encourage people to fill out this survey, whereas people who are not union members might see the survey and disregard it. Um, the current standard for getting a wage determination is that 50% or more than 50% have to report the same amount of wage, uh, same wage in order to have that be set as the prevailing wage rate. And if no wage gets there, you get a weighted average. Uh, in March 2022, the Biden administration proposed a rule that would change that to at least 30% of respondents. And kind of the talk about that is that this is to make it easier for union rates to be set as the prevailing wage, because it's easier for a union to control 30% of the market and set that as a prevailing wage, as opposed to a broad, uh, it, in a large market, it's hard for a union to get to 50%. This 30% rule is what it was pre-1980. Um, about 1980 is when it switched to this 50% rule, and it's been that for quite some time. Yeah, so I saw a question come across in the chat just asking, you know, does do these rules only apply if you're using union labor? And the answer to that is no. no. Um, they apply sort of across the board. It's just that it, it might be unions that are setting what the prevailing wage is in a particular yeah. jurisdiction. That's right. That's right. So, yes, yeah, so everyone, ha these have to apply to all, all laborers on the project for the particular types of work we talked about. But the unions are going to have a lot of people in those industries. I mean, the especially, I mean, it's region dependent, but in the Northeast, unions are are very prevalent in the construction industry and you're you're probably going to be using union work up there 
in some other areas like the Midwest, unions aren't quite as prevalent, but might have enough to set the prevailing wage. Um, and so you're more likely to get a union type of prevailing wage in those areas. Yeah, and I think another question we've been asked a lot is, does this mean I have to use union labor? And, and the answer to that is also no. No, yeah. But um, we'll kind of talk about the, the apprenticeship requirements, though. Might yeah, add a that, wrinkle that to might that. add a wrinkle to that, exactly. Um, let's see. So this is where you would go to find a prevailing wage if you were so inclined to look one up. Um, there's a, a website called sam.gov and you can search uh, on there. You can see that you have to select the type of prevailing wage you want, because as I mentioned, there are, there are some others. So you'd select construction, Davis-Bacon Act, and then you'd select the state, county, and the type of project that it's likely to be. And a, a PDF, a link to a PDF will be there. And there might be multiple ones in there, but usually there'll be one current one. Uh, multiple, so there might be multiple wage determination PDFs you link to, but there'll be one current one. And the, I mean, this is a, a short summary of one. I pulled some excerpts to put them next to each other, but mostly it's so you can see how, how widely they vary. And uh, I, I can't really see, it's a little too small for me to see the actual, what the wage <laughs> rates are on, on these. But uh, so you can see that I've just pulled for an electrician and in, on, on building projects. And so in, in Texas, you have an electrician on a building project being paid 23.18 in their wages and then 6.31 in fringe benefits that you can again pay as a either contribute uh, contribution to fringe benefits or as cash. Um, and then that's and that's for Midland County. And then you've got Harris County where it goes up to 3320 for the rate and then 1037 for for fringes. So that's that's a big difference. But then you look at New York and it's a significantly bigger difference. And it's gonna this is gonna be for Bronx, Kings, New York, uh, Richmond counties in New York, and it's $56 on the wage rate. And then the fringes are here listed as a percent of the rate that you actually pay plus a certain amount. So 76.72 of the rate you actually pay. So if you're paying above this rate, which you might be, then it, that's also going to increase what you have to pay in fringe benefits. So you can, as you're thinking about where you might want to do projects, you might want to look at this because it's, it's pretty different. Yeah, it can really impact your costs. Yeah. So, well, you know, I've said a number of times, right? It's 80% of your credit value that's on the line. So what happens if you have a footfall, right? You've, you've tried your best to comply. You've gone and checked this website, you've pulled the right data. You've made sure your EPC contractor's complying, right? You've kind of done everything you can, but then you realize, right? Hey, I, I didn't pay Bobby, right? Prevailing wages. Like is really 80% of your credit gonna go out the door? Well, they realized, right, that that was not sort of the right answer, right? You should be able to cure um, sort of foot faults. Um, and so how do you do that? Basically, you have to make up the payment to the employee. So you're gonna make them whole, right? Whatever they should have been paid, you're gonna pay them sort of the difference between what they were paid and what they should have been paid, plus basically an interest rate, right? Um, so you make the employee whole, you also pay uh, the IRS a penalty of $5,000 per underpaid worker, right? So that might sound steep, um, but if you kind of think about like, let's say you had a $200 million project and you're, you're taking ITCs on it. So you've got $60 million worth of ITCs at a 30% rate. This is $48 million of ITCs on the line, right? So you're probably always gonna cure, right? Like it's, it's not cheap, but it's also a lot cheaper than losing that credit value. Um, but if you have an intentional violation, you move into sort of much more punitive trouble damages type um, penalties. So this is, you know, you're claiming the full credit, but you have just really not even tried to comply. Um, and so then you have to make up the employee three times the difference. Um, so th they get a nice, uh, windfall there, um, plus the interest amount again, and then your penalties are substantially higher, 10,000 per underpaid worker instead of just 5,000. Um, so you can see that this, this situation is really uh, not a good one. Um, so you obviously want to try your best to comply. Um, so, I mean, what does, 
So it's like good faith compliance. Like how do you get there? How do you get to good faith compliance? Yeah. I, I think that that's one of the questions that we're looking for, for the IRS to, 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 answer. to answer. I mean, this does come up in other types of wage disputes where, you know, you might show that you got advice from a lawyer that you needed to do this particular thing and that or it was yeah. not required. That might show it wasn't an intentional violation here um, or something along the lines of, you know, we paid it to most of our people, but this person slipped through the cracks. Yeah. Yeah. So then who's likely to, like, is it going to be the IRS on audit who's going to bring this up or who's likely to bring these claims? So, so it could be the IRS yeah. on audit, obviously. Yeah. But I think a likely source of these is an employee who thinks they're being underpaid brings it to the attention of either the Department of Labor or the IRS. They file a claim with them. They call a hotline, that type of thing. There's not a private right of action under these for the employees, but they're going to, they can notify the government who can bring a claim on their behalf or penalize you. And so that might be the source of where, where kind of a, an audit comes from. Got it. So I think now we're gonna turn over the apprenticeship requirements. Yeah, and so this is probably the requirement that is familiar to a lot fewer number of people because this hasn't really ever been in a statute before. You might have seen something like this in a collective bargaining agreement, not quite exactly the same types of requirements we're seeing here, maybe something a little closer in a project labor agreement that requires you to use certain number of apprentices, which is essentially a, a collective bargaining agreement that goes spans multiple unions and is for a particular project. But again, they're not really going to be prevalent in most industries. And so I think this one's a little bit unusual and there's not a clear regulatory framework that we're working with, like the, even as clear as the, the Davis-Bacon Act is going to be. Um, an apprenticeship program is something that's actually quite official. It's not just, oh, I work under a person who's a, a trained professional in this. There are registered apprenticeship programs that can be approved by the Department of Labor or state apprenticeship agencies. And so the apprentices that we're talking about here is going to be someone who's actually in one of those registered programs. And I think one of the things that we're going to talk about is how there's not a lot of these programs in the renewable energy sectors yet. They're starting to get there. But right now, there's there's not a lot. Um, and But they do exist in construction industries generally. And there is a push from the Department of Labor to kind of create more of these. Yeah, so just again, what are the apprenticeship requirements under the law? Um, if you began construction prior to... Uh, 2023, you have to ensure that um, no less than the applicable percentage of the total labor hours of the project um, were performed by apprentices being 10%. Um, but in 2023, that ratchets up to 12 and a half. Um, in, after that, it goes up to 15%. Again, um, there's an exemption from all of these rules until they actually release guidance. So any project that began construction this year is, I think, sort of already in the bucket where, you know, you're not in these rules. So the 10% is honestly kind of irrelevant at this point. Um, so you're really looking at the 12 and a half or the 15% uh, bucket. Um, and it includes all hours worked by individuals employed by the taxpayer, contractors or subcontractors in the construction of the facility. Um, one of the, the differences, one of the differences between sort of the apprenticeship requirements and the prevailing wage requirements is we don't have the nuance of, um, you know, alteration and repair. The apprenticeship requirements do not apply in that uh, bucket, but it does apply with respect to the construction of the facility. Um, another thing to keep in mind is apprentices do not have to be paid uh, prevailing wages. So these are kind of two, two separate buckets. So while costs might go up on one hand, the apprentices um, do not have to be paid prevailing wages. Yeah, there's there's a separate uh, amount that they have to be paid that's set by the apprenticeship program that they're in, not the prevailing wage amount. Um, and so these, kind of what is an apprenticeship program? It's, it's someone who's getting a paid on the job training combined with classroom instruction. And like, McMurray mentioned it's going to have a wage rate that's lower than the Davis-Bacon prevailing wage. But those uh, apprenticeship programs are also going to have ratios of how many journeymen or who's kind of a regular laborer um, has to be on a project 
compared to an apprentice. So you can't just have all apprentices, for example. It might be hard to find that many to begin with, but you couldn't do that because they need to be trained and that's part of what program that they're in. And apprenticeship programs kind of come from a lot of different places, but the primarily, pri they primarily come from unions in the construction industry. And so that's one of the things that, that Mary was mentioning is that if you need to satisfy these apprenticeship programs, are you going to have to use union labor in order to get these apprentices? It's possible. I think that it kind of depends on what the sources of apprentices eventually end up being. We've Some companies start their own apprenticeship programs. I know Renewable Energy Systems has a big one. They have had it since 2014, and they're part of the DOL's initiative to help expand these programs. There's also in the solar in industry, I think in Florida, the uh, Florida Solar Energy Industry Association, along with UCF, University of Central Florida, has one that's specific for the solar industry. But there aren't a lot, and especially the ones that aren't affiliated with specific companies already are pretty small because they're just ramping up. So again, you have um, exceptions from from these rules, right? Like, what if what if you try and go find an apprentice and one is not available, right? Shouldn't you have an out? And I think they realize that yes, right? Like, it, it in some circumstances it might be difficult given sort of the uh, developing nature of the apprenticeship programs in this space, right? That they needed to provide sort of sort of re somewhat reasonable, at least, guideposts for this requirement. Um, so you can you can get out of these requirements if um, if you're denied, right? You submit an application, and you, you're just told no, we don't we don't have someone for that. Um, also, if you submit a request for an apprentice and you don't hear back within five business days, yeah, which, which seems is like a short amount it's of time, it's a very yeah. quick turnaround. Um, <laughs> but then there's a lot of questions about sort of well, how do you apply that, right? This is a uh, requirement based on hours. Like when you go into that sort of request, do you have to have set forth already, hey, we expect this apprentice to fulfill X number of labor hours and that's what we need. And, you know, so then when you get, when you don't hear back in five days, that's the number of hours you're sort of exempt from. It's all those nuances of this that, we just don't know yet. Yeah, and I think that some of the major questions that we have about the apprenticeship requirement are specifically about the good faith yeah. effort exception. Yeah. The, I mean, I'm looking at, I'm, with the number of apprenticeship programs that there are right now, I mean, do you just ask one, and then if they don't have it, are you done? Or have you have you satisfied the requirement? The statute kind of reads that way, but I'm I find it hard to believe that that's actually how it's going to work. Or if you ask one, and then that one doesn't respond to you in five days, right. are you, have you satisfied the good faith effort exception? It's that that's the kind of thing we're looking for now because I I don't know that it it makes sense as you as you read it now. Yeah, yeah, no, this this is an area where we absolutely need guidance where we might be able to fumble our way through applying Davis Bacon and prevailing wages without sort of additional guidance. Even though there's definitely guidance needed there too, this is one where it's yeah, it's guidance is absolutely necessary. Yeah, um, I mean, I again. Uh, trying to get a determination in advance is also one of the major areas that I yep. think that we'd, we'd like to see because again, so much is on the line. So much is on the line, yeah. So here again, we also have uh, cure options, again, kind of split into the two categories of the world of unintentional, right? You just foot faulted um, or intentional, you just really didn't try. Um, and because this requirement is based on labor hours, the um, penalties are also based on labor hours. Um, so in the unintentional, it's $50 and the intentional, it ratchets up to $500 a labor hour. So really steep, uh, penalties. And, you know, you could imagine like this is projects take a long time to build. And if you've got like, you know, a 15% labor hour requirement and so many number of labor hours were not fulfilled, like this could actually get to be a pretty expensive, uh, penalty here. Yeah, so one of the things that we get asked all the time, right, is can I just get around these rules by subcontracting out, right? And if I can't, 
how do I deal with that, right? Yeah. And so the answer is pretty clearly no, no right. you can't. Um, and that, that would be way too easy of an out. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the, so the IRA itself is in the statute very clear that it applies to laborers and mechanics employed by the taxpayer or any contractor or subcontractor. So you're going to have to make sure that those contractors and subcontractors that you work with, are they comply. Um, in the government contracts world, we refer to these as flow down requirements. Um, so if you have a subcontractor on a government contract, you have an obligation to inform them of the obligations and it's your responsibility to make sure that they comply. That's, it it kind of works the same way here, even though there isn't an explicit flow down requirement, but it's ultimately going to be the taxpayer that's responsible for making sure that all the obligations are, are met or they're not going to get the tax credit. And so there's kind of on the front end, you wanna make sure that you're, you're doing certain things. You're going to want to include the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements in your contracts. You know, you might write that broadly. You might try to say you contractor and, su and your subcontractors are responsible for complying. They might not like that. They might want you to be more specific and tell them what they need to do because they're not familiar with these requirements. You might see, you, you might need to get record keeping um, from them because depending on the size of that contractor or subcontractor, they might not keep good records all on their own. So you might need to build in an obligation to either have them keep them and store them or to have them provide them to you so that you have them in the event of an audit. Um, it's ultimately, you're the one who's going to have to show the IRS that you're in compliance. Yeah, and I think one of the questions we got was like, okay, so if you, if you, need to cure right so you say okay well i owe some money to cure because i did have because a subcontractor failed to pay um prevailing wages who's who's going to pay that cure amount well it's going to be the taxpayer that has generated the credit not not the subcontractor but you can have in your contracts right contractual obligations and rights so that you have a sort of claim then against yeah your yeah. contractor going down to the subcontractor. So you level. might have an indemnity of right. sorts. You might also just have, I mean, it, it'd essentially be a breach uh, that you could right. you could come after, but the you, you, you have to think about these things because kind of trying to do it on the back end after you've got an existing contract might be very difficult. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're already building in sort of, even though we don't fully know the rules yet, we're building in sort of compliance with these labor requirements into EPC contracts because you have to be able to um, we're not we're not confident that a particular project may have begun construction right by the time we, we reach that 60 day clock so but we're working on the EPC contract right now right so we have to be able to make sure we can flip a switch to really turn on compliance in this area yeah one of the things that you might consider that's a more hands-on approach is to actually have some sort of compliance program with your contractors where you require them to provide you with the information that you need to assess whether they're doing it correctly that that's certainly more hands-on and you have to balance that with certain considerations about whether that makes them actually your employees but it's certainly something you would want to keep in mind here Kind of on the flip side, contractors will need to make these considerations themselves. Are they going to want to be told specifically what IRA prov uh, provisions they need to comply with or what the prevailing wages for specific jobs that they have because they don't know how to comply on their own? They're going to want to keep track of what liabilities they have as a result of non-compliance if it happens. So are they going to be on the hook for the whole tax amount? It seems unlikely that they'd be able to satisfy that. Right, right. So like, what's the credit quality of your contractor and subcontractor? And, you know, what are the <clears throat> sort of guarantees or other financial backstops you have to that? And, you know, but then also looking at it from the perspective of, yes, the, the headline amount that's on the line, right, is, is huge, right? Mm -hmm. The 80% is huge. But what you really need to fix this is, is the cure, the cure amount, amounts, yeah. right? So I think you can probably work with your EPC contractor and your subcontractors to understand like, look, this is very, very important to me because it does make up 80% of the credit amount. But in the event you have a foot fault, you know, the amount you're gonna owe me is not that, right? Like the loss that I'm going to incur is not the full 80%. It's going to be this cure amount, right? So 
kind of getting everybody on the same page in terms of realizing this is very, very important, right? Because it makes up so much of the value of the credit, but then at the same time, like, you know, because most, most EPC contractors are not in the position to really actually indemnify you for 80% of the right. credit value. But can they indemnify you for the cure? Probably. Probably, yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the other things that to keep in mind in these is that over the course of the contract, the prevailing wage might change. And so if you have a flat rate that you're paying to the contractor, they might want to see an adjustment if the prevailing wage goes up. And so that's, I would expect to see that built into a lot of these negotiations, mm -hmm. a lot of these contracts. Yeah, a lot more sort of pass through elements rather than turnkey in terms of making the sort of project owner bear the costs of the prevailing wage rather than the EPC contractor taking on that risk themselves. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So the IRS uh, published a handful of notices at the beginning of October uh, notice 22-51, if anyone cares to go look it up, deals with this particular topic um, and has, ha has asked a number of questions sort of uh, looking for input on prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements, including, you know, just a broad sort of what should you consider in, uh, you know, rules for taxpayers to correct a deficiency for failure to satisfy the prevailing wage requirements, right? Like, so how should that uh, procedure work and what documentation or substantiation should be required to, you know, show uh, compliance with the prevailing wage. And I guess I'd be interested, do you think like for that specific question, is there sort of a standard set of documentation that you keep in Davis-Bacon sort of typically? Yeah, so Davis-Bacon has essentially a form that you fill out with the wage rates that you've paid. And then Davis-Bacon itself would require weekly submission to the contracting officer. Um, and I, I, as far as we can tell that that particular requirement doesn't apply here because there's no one to submit it to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the, but there, you would have some, a form and you'd see what information you need to keep based on what's on that form. Yeah. So there might be something there they can kind of draw from, but modify to yeah. fit and sort of this To make area. sure you have the payroll records that would allow you to draw that information mm -hmm. because usually it's gonna be those payroll records that have everything you need. Yeah, that makes sense. And then you know, like we, we discussed this question earlier, what if any clarification is needed regarding the good faith exception, right? Like wh what does it mean to really go out and try and find apprentices? And you know, if you've made a good faith effort, you get out of that requirement. So it's obviously important to understand what good faith means because in some areas, right? Because right. there aren't as many established programs, it might be difficult to find yeah. apprentices. There right? might be none in an area for a particular kind of project. Right. So yeah. obviously understanding what that is and, and making sure you've at least shown a good faith effort is important. Um, and then, you know, what documentation or substantiation do taxpayers maintain or could they create to demonstrate compliance with the apprenticeship requirements um, or the good faith exception? Again, I think, you know, the apprenticeship is just kind of a little bit of no man's land a little bit. So yeah. it would be nice to have more guidance on sort of, you know, what is good faith and what do I have to maintain to show uh, that I made a good faith effort. Um, so one of the interesting things is, you know, these came out at the beginning of October. Um, they requested comments by November 4th, which is just incredibly quick. Um, but they have a note in all of the notices that they've released saying, but we will consider comments received after that date as long as, you know, it doesn't delay the issuance of guidance. Um, we're aware that sort of a number of large sort of groups that you would typically think are going to comment on these, you know, various tax topics like the New York State Bar Association, the ABA, et cetera, are going to be late. Like they did not get them in. Um, <laughs> and so uh, there's still probably a number of comments to come. There have been some comments uh, posted. I know they're working on going through them. Um, but if they're really going to get these this particular piece of guidance out by the end of the year, and that is what was said at an ABA tax meeting in Dallas by an IRS official, um, it's, you know, that might really limit what comments they're able to consider. Yeah. So, 
I think we'll I, open it up for some questions. questions. Yeah. Investors will probably come in sooner, or will it be addressed more by like ITC insurance and RWI? Yeah, I mean, you might see insurance products develop on this, but it'll become part of the due diligence process, right? And if a tax equity investor is investing, right, they're going to want to go because they're typically coming in um, kind of later in the process, right? A good amount of the project has already been built. Um, and so they're going to want to see compliance, right? So it's, it's just going to add to the due diligence effort on sort of the tax equity investment side. And so not only for being able to substantiate that you paid prevailing wages like to the government, um, you're going to want that if you're looking at a tax equity investor, you're going to want that to be able to substantiate it to them as well. Yeah. And, and to follow up on that, do you think that with those thresholds that they're going to shoot, you know, only a couple percentage points over? Like, what would, what would you um, advise? In terms of, like, the total labor hours? The 10%, 12 and a half, and 15%. 15%, right? Should you be shooting for, like, 17%, right? I think that kind of remains to be seen, right? We'll see how the guidance comes out. and. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that because the cure provisions in those are based on the hours that were not... Uh, used for apprentices, if you're a little bit below, the cure is a small amount. Right. So I don't think you need to be worried about being a large amount over. Maybe you want a small cushion, but the cure is based on the number of hours. So if you're 100 hours short, you don't have to pay all that much to cure. Right, right. And I think they're you're probably showing good faith yes. compliance yeah. if you've really used apprentices for, you know, 14.98% of your hours, right? Yeah. Um, So I actually have two as well. Yeah. One being, is it you have to satisfy both or can you satisfy one? For example, I believe prevailing wage on the Gulf Coast would be pretty easy to achieve, especially in your estimate, uh, because you know what that's going to be. But as far as the apprenticeship, if you're not able to satisfy that and you don't, you didn't put in your yeah. good faith, is there, is it incremental? No, it's, you got to do both. All or nothing. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And then with that, seeing how people would try to get around it, so if I was already building a facility on the Gulf Coast and I'm going to do a ton of civil work and a ton of man hours on site, now I'm going to pick a location that doesn't require civil work and I'm going to order in mega modules to limit the amount of hours on the site. Do you know if there's going to be or do you have an opinion on whether or not they're going to require a certain percent of construction to occur on site to uh, decentivize somebody doing a mega module? I mean, I think those are all like questions to be answered. I think we got one through the chat that was similar. It's like, you know, what is considered really construction of the facility, right? right? Does that have to be on site or are sort of, you know, large activities going on off site that then are, you know, brought to the site considered part of the construction of the project? So in the context of Davis Bacon, again, and remains yeah. to be seen how much this transfers over, Custom construction offsite is going to be part of the project, but if you're buying something more off the shelf that you have delivered, then that's not going to be considered uh, part of the project. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Also, have, <clears throat> excuse me, two questions. So I'm assuming on this distinction between repairs versus maintenance that the tax construct of 162, 263 is really irrelevant. You're basically looking at 162 type activities and trying to distinguish whether what's maintenance and what's repair. I mean, I think that depends on, do they draw from the existing tax code or do they go look at Davis-Bacon fully, right? Like what set of rules are we applying? And I actually would lean towards saying it's probably Davis-Bacon rules in terms of what you consider alteration and repair versus, uh, you know, alteration versus just maintenance, right? Um, but, it, and the reason I'm saying that is like they've, they've drawn in, for example, the domestic content bonus, they've drawn from the transportation code. Um, so because they've already sort of indicated that we're looking at Davis-Bacon for these provisions, I would expect that those rules 
are what apply, but it would be nice to have clarity. Yeah, it would seem that the Texas sales tax on repairs may provide guidance on here because they do draw a bright line between yeah. uh, ongoing maintenance, not being subject to sales tax, repairs being subject to sales tax. Yeah, I think the problem there is going to be, though, that I think they're, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, I think the uh, alteration repair slash, you know, maintenance buckets are kind of federally determined mm -hmm. as opposed to sort of looking at those items yeah. are not localized. Where the wage is localized, the kind of delineation between categories of activities are more federally. Yeah, at least decided. in looking at what is a day, what is covered Davis-Bacon work, we would not typically look at state tax uh, law. <laughs> and then uh, just a follow up, and it's a little bit outside the scope of today's presentation, but you touched upon some of the benefits under the IRA for these uh, green credits, if you will. Any feel what the market practice is gonna be on pricing on trans on transfers of some of the credits? Or is it, it just I'm, gonna evolve? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a lawyer, so I am not a banker. <laughs> um, but at the same time, I think that um, it's probably going to depend on a number of factors, right? Uh, because you're going to be looking um, to probably pay some sort of discount, right? Otherwise, unless you're getting sort of really good ESG benefits from buying the credits, maybe you end up in the world where uh, you're paying a dollar for dollar. But I think we have lively debates on this internally. So, um <laughs> I personally don't think that's where you, you end up. I think there is probably a discount on the credits. And what sort of dictates what that discount is, I think, depends on a variety of factors. For example, you're going to have essentially like a purchase and sale agreement probably for the credits. And sort of what's the what are the terms of that agreement? What's the credit quality of the seller of the credit? Um, are you, as the seller, are you going and sort of lining up someone in advance, kind of more like a tax equity transaction? You, before you even generate the credit, you have a buyer lined up. I think your pricing there is probably going to be more, a little bit higher than you've already generated a credit and you're going into a secondary market and are trying to offload it. Um, I think there's, there's a bunch of different considerations I think that'll come into play, but I think it's also just too early to tell. Maybe it becomes a very fluid market and there's a well-established price. I think, you know, we know state tax credits generally trade around 80 cents on the dollar is kind of what we've heard. So uh, we'll see. Yeah. Well, it looks like we're at one o'clock. We a lot of questions came up in the chat that kind of flew by us. Yes. And so we'll, we'll follow up with those offline. Um, thank you for, for attending and asking the questions. Yes. Um, so, let's get it.